Welcome. Uh, my talk is about looking ahead, PHP 5.5. My name is David Zoriapara. I'm one of the release managers of PHP 5.5, which uh, means I'm responsible for packaging, uh, looking into security fixes uh, and announcements. Um, yes. So the talk, I will just cover like some parts of PHP 5.5. I'll look into what we're going to break which is kind of interesting for you, I guess, uh, and look like into current discussions, um, what has been discussed, because obviously 5.5 is not out yet. Um, nevertheless, first of all, I want to actually start with a look back into the year 2012, because honestly, 2012 was a great year for PHP. Why? Because first of all, we have seen like a big adoption of Symfony 2 uh, and Silex as a micro-framework. And we have seen the release of Send Framework 2, which was great, right? And we have seen new tools come out that help us to develop our software. We have finally a decent uh, dependency management system called Composer. So from the PHP community perspective, 2012 was a great year. A lot of drive, you know, two major frameworks brought out a new version. Um, so after like a few years where we're like, oh, it's not going on that much in PHP. Finally, it's a year, a lot of stuff came out. But this was only community stuff, right? And in the core itself, I think the core itself had a huge drive and like new people coming in, new development in general. And I want to you know, talk about a little bit about why 2012 was a great year for PHP, not just from community and framework perspective, but also from the core. And one of the first thing I want to talk about is, is what we call the RFC process. And I'm, not, I'm pretty sure there are a few people in the audience which think it's a pain in the ass, but I think this is one of the best things PHP has done over the last years as the core internals group is to enable new people to bring in their ideas as, you know, as a wiki page, as a request for a comment, uh, where they show you know, what they're going to change, how they want to go, how, how they want to change it, and where they think about you know, what's the implications of the change. And then after discussions on the internal mailing list, they can just call for a vote, and we just vote on on the feature, and then it's decided if it's go in, go, goes in or not. And this really helped a lot of new people to get into the community, uh, help people that have been affiliated with the community for a long time, but never been part of the core development team, to bring in their ideas, and basically to open up the PHP community uh, to like f more people that work on frameworks and need a specific feature to go in, and so on and so forth. So this really helped to drive PHP in 2012, I think. And the second thing which helped us a lot was what is called the time-based release plan. And I'm not sure who has heard about that yet, um, but this is actually the reason why I'm standing here in front of you and talk about PHP 5.5 already. Because if you remember, uh, PHP 5.4 was released in 2012, February 2012, actually a year ago. Um, and if you think about when did but then when did we release 5.3, right? That was somewhere in 2008, so it took us three and a half years to release 5.4 from 5.3 on. And 5.3 was even worse, right? So um, we figured out, well, it's not really motivating for people, for like both the community to move to a new version and particularly not for core developers to work on a new version. If you spend like four years waiting that your code finally hits the wild and then another three years till it actually is in use. So we thought, uh, why, you know, a lot of other projects do it much better, so we could ado adopt that. And since this year and 5.5 is kind of the first try of that, and we already failed with that, but I'll explain that later, that we do a um, release every year, right? From now on, you will see 5.5 this year in May, probably, and you will see 5.6 next year in May, hopefully. So let's think about that. So in May 2014, you will have PHP 5.6 out there, you will have 5.5 out there, and you will have 5.4 out there. Uh, honestly, who of you is still using 5.2? Who is using 5.4? 
Okay, so the rest is 5-3. So if your neighbor is asleep, uh, you, um, the guy on the right next to you, please wake him up because this is an important announcement here right now. Uh, as you can imagine, three versions, to maintain three versions is a pain in the ass, right? 5-6, 5-5, 5-4. But we have 5-3, right? So the PHP community um, in the last two weeks sat together and uh, decided and wrote an RFC about it and voted on it. Um, how what are we doing with PHP 5.3? And this is like, I think, one of the biggest announcements today, if you have not followed the internal mailing list, um, we are going to EOL PHP 5.3 in 2014. So there will be no bug fixes anymore, not even security bug fixes from the 5.6 release on in a year now. So, what does it mean also? That means that once we release 5.5, you get only security fixes from the community. Obviously, if you have a distribution that you know, does some LTS support and so on and so forth, um, you get longer support. But from our side, 5.3 is done in a year from now. And I know that Johannes, the current release manager, is looking forward to this point where you can finally, after like four, uh, six years of maintaining this stuff, uh, put this away. So, that's kind of interesting that uh, you have like approximately one and a half years to ma migrate to something new. So, let's look into what is new, actually. Uh, so, you get a, uh, you know, a feeling of what you have to do, and, you know, what we added, actually. Um, so, I'm, you know, I'm a nerd. I really love language features a lot. So we'll start off with some random language feature that is, I think, the biggest addition in PHP 5.5, but it might not be the most useful one, to be honest. And that is the so-called generators. Uh, who of you have ever worked with Python? You should. Python is awesome. Um, so general, generators are an idea which we, I would say borrow, but actually we stole it right away from Python. Uh, because why not steal good ideas, right? So, um, over the last years, uh, PHP, you know, tried to incorporate more language features which help you to write more concise code, you know, shorter stuff, you know, we have closures so you don't have to write functions and come up with some random function names. So we, we uh, introduced generators. Um, also, it's a part of this making code a bit more concise. And the basic idea was, well, if you look into something that people write from time to time, like iterators, uh, it's a fairly complex thing to do, writing an iterator. So look at this thing. It's a, an iterator to remember that for you is like nothing else than just a plan on how to traverse stuff. Right? How to traverse any kind of data. Most of the time it's a data structure, it can be a stream, it can be anything. Right? It's just an algorithm around that. And to write such a thing in PHP at the moment in 5.4, you have to, you know, implement the iterator uh, interface. Um, so if you want to traverse, for example, in this very stupid example, obviously, uh, just natural numbers, you end up with a very, very complex implementation of an iterator that does nothing else than get a counter up, right? So, and if you think about what most of the iterators do, like director iterators and I know, zip file iterators, what they are, everything that there is, filter iterators, they're basically for each loops that are, have like a bit of logic in it. So, generators is the idea to use this only this big for each loop and put it into a function and uh, make, you know, make this useful in a, in a small, concise way. So, how it would look a range iterator in a, in a, as a generator? This is what a complete iterator implementation of this looks. So it's basically a function, right? You can read right away. Like, I think everything is readable except for this interesting yield statement. And that's actually what makes an iterator an iterator. What does it do? And that's pretty hard to explain for most people. It's hard for me to explain. It's hard to understand, I think. Yield does nothing else. It's similar to return. So at that point, if you call it, the function will start to the point where it reaches the first yield statement. And at that point, it returns the actual value, in this case, i, the variable i. 
And then, unlike a standard return value, return, it does not, you know, complete the function and goes back to the, to the original caller. Well, it goes back to the original caller, but it saves the current state of the function. So it can resume the function later, right? So an iterator, you would go ahead and walk to the yield statement, then return the value, and then the, the generator basically waits till it's called the next time, and then it will resume from that state on, okay? So that's the basic idea behind it. And now generators, or like iterators, can do a lot more stuff, right? Iterators can um, return, uh, oh, like, look at this example for a second, uh, yeah. That's, I want to talk about that because uh, there's a small difference. Um, we saw, we saw, uh, we see, right? This is a function, but if you call it, it does not behave like a function. It actually will return a generator object, and this generator object is nothing else than something that implements an iterator. So it can just call any iterator function except for one on this object, right? And you can put it into a for each and it will just right away work out. It's pretty, pretty nice, right? It's much easier than writing this. So, <clears throat> but as I said like before, uh, iterators can do more. They can return keys for every value that they return. So, well, generators can that too, right? Use this uh, just arrow syntax as we, you know, know it from uh, somewhere else. And this is a very stupid and very easy way in how to make requests to multiple uh, URLs. So what it does, it starts out on for each URL that you put into this request function, it goes, it, it does the request until the first yield statement gets the result, returns the result with the URL, and then waits. What, and we return to the for each and can process the result of the first URL request, uh, do whatever we want, and then we continue with the next request, right? Um, so in the, good the good thing about this is it's, you know, you don't have to buffer everything into memory at once. You go one request after another. It's just a very easy thing. Uh, to do, because uh, I will talk about it later, it's pretty hard to come up with easy generators that don't need much explanation about what is going on. So generators are iterators. Uh, you can call every method that you know from an iterator on a generator, except for rewind. Well, there is an, well, rewind you could do until you reach the first yield statement because then we, the, the compiler has no way to figure out how to go back to the first state of the function. Um, then there are more advanced things and I'm think, I don't really want to talk about it because if you really you know, need it, you will figure out how to send values into a generator, how to throw stuff into a generator and so on and so forth. It's, it's fairly interesting. So lots of code more. Uh, people were asking me about some interesting way how to use a generator. And from the Python community, there's one way they use the generators is to move more iterators together. So I wanted to traverse a directory. Uh, and every time I encounter a zip file, I will, I want to read the content of the zip file as if it is a directory, right? It makes sense. So what I can do, I use a directory iterator and throw it into this generator called read. And this is poorly written code because it's my code, so I don't think it's like the best way to write such a thing. It's probably much better ways. Uh, if you see in channels like core developer write PHP code, it's usually bad code. So um, what I do is I traverse all the files that I get, and if every time I encounter a zip file, I go into my generator, uh, generator that reads the zip file, right? It, it just reads the zip file entry after entry and yells the, uh, the entry. So uh, and if not, if I don't see a zip file, I just go ahead and return the file itself. And in the end, I will have something really nice. I can hopefully show you the. Uh, I, I have something like this, right? So every every time I encounter like a zip file, I just read the content of the zip file itself as well. Okay, so it's pretty nice. It's one of the few things I could came up which just makes, you know, doesn't need too much explanation. Anyway, so that's for generators if you really want to read about more. Um, 
And then there's one thing I think that's like for most people the most important addition that we did is a pass password hashing API that is clean, simple, and everybody can use it. Why do we need that? Who of you is using SHA-2 family members to generate or hash passwords and store them in database, like SHA-512, SHA-256? Who is using those? Who is using SHA-1? Who is using MD5? Uh, who is storing them in clear text? <laughs> so, um, the problem is, usually we don't want to store a clear text password, obviously, so we need to find a way to hash them. And what we've done for the last years, over the, over the last years, is using MD5 or SHA-1, and that is a bad idea. Why it's a bad idea? Because they are cryptographically not secure anymore. That means there are multiple attacks that you can do against them. The first one is collision attacks. It's kind of hard to pull off, but there's advanced research on how to do uh, collision attacks on MD5, and it kind of works out. Probably not for passwords, but it usually works. Then there are rainbow tables, so you can just uh, get tables of all hashes of all of eight character uh, passwords on the whole ASCII set, which is kind of big, includes special characters, um, and it's just one terabyte. It's not easy, but space is cheap, right? can go ahead buy for 80 euros a freaking one terabyte uh, drive and you'll be done. Um, so that's, that's easy. And then there's the thing called GPUs, which made cryptography's life hard because they are really good at doing a lot of, uh, a lot of operations that are similar to each other on a lot of data. And you can just go ahead, and if you don't have a GPO cluster to brute force passwords, you can go ahead to a service called Amazon, and you just can buy one for a day, and then you can start ahead and uh, go ahead and try to brute force it. And if you're lucky, with enough one or two days, maybe four days, you can crack a password. It's not that hard anymore. So MD5s and SHA-1's passwords are broken, and you should not use them. What you actually should use is, or that's what we try to do with a new password API set, is um, we want to have an easy to use password hashing API that knows from our perspective the best known password hashing algorithm and it includes known protections. And what are protections? The first ones include assault. That means for every password that we generate, um, that we get and have to hash, we generate a random string and add it to it. And just append the string or prepend it, and then we hash. So, you rainbow table attacks don't work well, very well anymore. And unlike other, most of the other stuff that you want to do in computer science, uh, hashing algorithms, if they are slow, it's good for you. <laughs> because it makes it much harder for guys who try to generate a billion of those. It doesn't, it, it doesn't really affect you because 200 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds, it doesn't really matter for you. But it matters for a guy who tries to do a billion of those. Okay? So it keeps people from brute forcing. And this is what it looks like. Uh, the password API is really easy. Uh, you do, you put a, you know, your secret, your password into the password hash function. Function, and then you'd say, oh, we want, I want to use the password default um, uh, value there. Um, that is basically which implementation we use. Well, for hashing, it's, there's only one. And then you get out a hash, and the hash, that's the nice thing about it. It includes all the option that is necessary to calculate the hash. It includes the salt, and it includes the hash. And just use this one hash and store it in the database, and you'll be done. Okay, so this is the first step, and then you obviously want to verify it against some input that the user gave you, and you get that hash from the database, and you compare it against the hash that you have, uh, against the password that you have uh, from the user with the password verify. And because we store everything, every information that is needed to produce, produce the hash, um, except for the plain text password, obviously, uh, in this hash string already, the verify method doesn't need any options or anything, right? You just, you know, go ahead and uh, do that. So that's really, really easy. And then there are two more advanced functions. If you came up in 10 years and, you know, uh, GPUs were so f are so fast in like 10 years maybe that you, you know, the, the cost, how, how slow your algorithm actually is, your hashing algorithm is, you know, it's, it's not slow enough anymore. You can rehash it with more cost 
so it's even slower because the, our hashing algorithm is called bcrypt and it has a cost factor that means as the higher the cost factor is, the slower it becomes, which is good for you and bad for the attacker. So as that, we using, we want to use from now, now on, from five on, you want to create password hashes uh, using this password API that just saves them in the database. It's easy and safe, and we use this algorithm called bcrypt, which relies on a hashing function from Blowfish, which is considered uh, cryptographic secure at the moment. There are no known collision attacks, so it's pretty nice, and it's slow. Cool. And then we added a lot of the little things. Uh, I, I cannot talk about everything, but just a few things. Uh, there's this one thing. Uh, who have, of you have ever tried to call empty on a function result? And failed, obviously, because it doesn't work. In 5.5, five, it finally works. So you can put arbitrary expressions into empty, and it will work. So this works, uh, finally. Uh, it does not work for a set because of the semantic behavior of a set. It doesn't really make sense. If you can read about that in the RFC uh, as to why we refused it. Um, so in MT it works. Then we added bool vol, which is basically just as int vol and everything else. And then we added daytime immutable. The where's Derek? There's Derek, the guy who wrote daytime and responsible for this. Uh, so give him beer for that or wine. Um, Daytime immutable is the idea that, well, in the current implementation of daytime, I create a daytime object and it's today, right? Automatically it's today. And then I modify today and I want to get out tomorrow, right? Plus one day. And then I compare it today, tomorrow, and what? It is the same thing, right? Uh, how can a date actually change, right? Today is today and not tomorrow. Tomorrow might be today someday, but it's not today, to, you know? So this is, the problem here is that the object itself gets modified when you call modify on it, right? So, and people were thinking about it, well, that's not how we use date, dates usually. Dates kind of are immutable, you know? It, the current date doesn't change. <laughs> Anyway, so we added daytime immutable, um, and it will never modify the object itself, but return a new object. So this works now, uh, makes much more, much more sense, I think. Um, there's an open discussion about um, daytime immutable at the moment extends from daytime, but has a different behavior, and there's a lot of back and forth if we really want to do it. I think we're kind of settled on that we're doing it um, to make it easier for people to uh, use existing APIs, but then you run into problem if the existing API relies on the modification uh, methods and cannot do it anymore. So on and so forth. There's a big bit back and forth since I think it's not 100% settled. Uh, people tr still try to convince uh, Derek that's uh, not a good idea, but I think at the moment we're settled. So that's good. And then for all the people, this, that's a feature for all the people who write ref, a lot of reflection stuff, PHP unit guys, Doctrine 2 guys, and so on and so forth, is they had the problem that if you have two files, and one, you know, have a namespace PHP UK and then a class conference, and then you want to make a reflection on this conference class, well, this fails. Why does it fail? Because reflection class actually is the fully, qual fully, fully qualified name, and it doesn't have that at that point. Um, so we need a way to get the fully qual qualified name, and f this is kind of uh, similar to like, I don't know, it's not really similar to Java, but it looks like Java. Um, we have this colon colon class thing, and it will always re return the fully qualified name of the uh, class. Fairly easy. It's nice if you write debuggers or any tools around debugging and you, you want to get stack traces and you know stuff like that. It's fairly easy. Uh, well, this I want to skip. And then finally, we have finally. So you can do try finally. It's, uh, I think it's been bugging people for years. I never used it myself. I never needed it myself. But finally, it will always be executed, uh, even if there's an exception. So uh, you don't have to write duplicated code, but instead can just go ahead and um, well, finally. Anyway, 
And there's lots of more stuff, and you can, I mean, you're all developers, you're all smart, hopefully. Um, then you can go ahead and just read about all the changes, and there will be probably lots of articles and blog posts about it anyway. So, in good old fashion, we're always breaking things, because there was a lot of old stuff that is, uh, you know, broken, and um, we have to fix it. I mean, every release, does stuff, but this release actually doesn't break that much stuff. But in case you're the guy right next to you is already asleep, this is the second big announcement that you should really wake him up because MySQL extension is deprecated from now on. Oh my god, don't panic. Because this means the old, old, old MySQL extension and not the MySQL I extension and not the PDO MySQL extension. Only the old, old MySQL extension, which apparently is still used in WordPress, so the people who run WordPress will have a fun time uh, with this deprecation. Um, so this is deprecated now, and every time you call MySQL, connect or something like that, you will get a deprecation error. Which most of, which if you use the production, any setting doesn't affect you that much, but most people are hopefully use the development setting because it makes much more sense. Uh, and those will run into this problem that they get deprecation errors. Anyway, so use MySQL I and use PDO MySQL. You should already since the last years. It's been a long time since we've introduced MySQL I. I don't even know since when. So it's years. And then this e modifier is deprecated in the prec replace. I don't. I, I was thinking, well, I show you. Should I show you the e modifier? And then I was like thinking, no, you're not showing evil things to people. It's not good. So I refuse to show you what it does. I just tell you it's gone. And if you've ever used it, you should be ashamed of yourself. And it is gone. And use. Uh, replace callback instead, prec replace callback. So that's the only two things that we actually get rid of, um, which is, I think, kind of nice. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit um, about, oh, we're, I'm fast, faster than I anticipated, uh, a little bit about the current discussions that we have. and. You know, look into the community what we're discussing because 5.5 is not out. It's probably going to, like, we released an alpha today, Alpha 5, which you always should try out. And it's going to be the last one. We're going to do a beta afterwards. But let's look into the current discussion. So, who of you is using APC? Lots of people. Who of you are not switching to 5.4 because of APC? Oh, only a few. I know a lot more people, actually, uh, that say, oh, IPC doesn't work with 5.4 at the moment, so I cannot switch. So we had this problem that over the last years, we wanted to integrate APC into the core, and then kind of the development base or the developers of of APC left the project, and in the end there were only one or two maintainers, and there was nobody really there to maintain or bring this fairly complex code base into a shape where we can you know, put it into core and have a finally an upcode cache into core. And this is, a, as far as I know, a, lot of, a big problem for a lot of companies out there why they don't use 5.4, because they need an upcode cache that actually works for them. And most of them actually rely also on APC functions. So, Last, like a month ago, Zen came up and it's like they said, like, uh, well, we have this thing called Zen Optimizer uh, since a few years, and it's been closed source since ever since. But there's no real business value anymore in f us having it closed source, so uh, we could open source it. It's much simpler than APC. It's also as fast as APC, as far as I know. Uh, we could make it work, uh, I guess. So. Then they started the whole discussion of, well, we can have an opcode cache finally. So Send decided, okay, we do this. And since two weeks, Send optimizes open source. And it is hopefully, there is an RFC out there. And there is the problem that people have to vote on it. And there might be a vote against it for whatever reason. But hopefully, it is moving into core, which means that with 5.5, you get an opcode cache right out with PHP and don't have to, you know, care about any extensions anymore about that. There, there are two problems with that. First of all, it delays PHP 5.5 by like a month or two. 
Second, it's not APC because people rely on APC functions. Uh, I think that like the only two problems at the moment. Ah, oh, there's a third problem if you would use Windows or and threat, I don't know, PHP threaded safety enable, which most people don't. Luckily, uh, then it doesn't work at the moment. So and then we had this long discussion about C sharp like properties. It's a way to rewrite getters and setters in a very easy way, uh, borrowed from C sharp. And this went through two or three iterations. And if you've ever hoped to see this in core, it's not going to be in core. It's finally the, the last vote on this. Uh, uh, said like, no, we don't want to have this, so you're not getting C-sharp like properties if you've ever followed the internal discussion as closely as uh, I do. Well, I have to do to say that. Um, and then Sarah, which is also in the audience, uh, has an RFC out there for trailing commas and function calls, which is similar to trailing commas and uh, array syntax. Uh, kind of makes sense to make it, you know, a bit more it just we have it in arrays. Why not have it in function calls anyway? So this is uh, still ongoing. Uh, I cannot think of any bigger other discussion except for daytime immutable at the moment, which is ongoing. So this might change. And we are going to enter beta stage in like two weeks from now. Hopefully, integrating send optimizers somewhere along the way, um, so we can have a final in May. And then, as said before. Uh, a year from then, you have five, six already out. Um, so that's kind of huge. Uh, you really have to make sure uh, that your code is, is that your code is getting ready within the next two, three years till it hits the wild. I think four, five, four, and five, five. So not that much news from five, five perspective. Obviously, because it's a, the the development uh, life cycle was shorter than the usual PHP. Uh, cycle that we did. Um, but yeah, it's uh, looking ahead. So um, you can probably see the big distributions have it in either October or probably April next year, 5.5 five then. Um, it's probably too late for Ubuntu and Fedora for this year, talking to them, because they have long uh, integration times. Yeah. So And then you will see 5.5 five out in the wild in about one to, one to three years. OK, so this was much faster than I anticipated. Um, but this leaves quest open time for questions. Thank you very much. Are there <laughs> any questions that I can answer, or maybe somebody else in the audience who knows more about the code? Yes? PHP 6. <laughs> uh, if you have followed the development of PHP 6, uh, we try to do uh, integrate um, Unicode completely into the core in, in all aspects. And then a two years, like four, two years ago, we decided, well, the current approach is not going to work. And uh, we get rid of it, so we just deleted it. And after that, we have been still waiting for somebody who cares about Unicode um, to come up with a better idea. And uh, as far as I know, the Russian community have kind of adapted to MB string and so on and so forth, and use this. And most of the European con community doesn't really care too much. Um, but if you if you come up with a great idea how to use do you Unicode and have the time in the in, uh, to actually make you know make whatever your approaches happen, then you're more than welcome to write an RFC about um, because we're really looking forward to have finally Unicode support. But at the moment, nobody's doing it. It's open source. Sarah. That's actually another thing in five five. Uh, you convert class to that. Oh, yeah, you you convert right. Okay, so yeah, Sarah, Sarah added uh, uh, you convert a class uh, to uh, Intel, I think. Uh, yeah, and you can convert uh, from languages to languages, uh, from from character set to character set, not languages, character set to character set, uh, but transparently. And so it's it's much easier that way, much easier. But still, it's not like integrated into it like you would expect, like from Java or something. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi. Uh, 
Oh, okay. Uh, what's the compatibility with Zen Framework version one? Pardon? Compa with 5.5, .5, what was the compatibility with Zen Framework 1. Point whatever uh, version we're using going to be like? Well, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> in all honesty, like, I, it's, I, I'm doing this asshole approach of it's not my problem. Right? Because I, I'm responsible for the language, not for the frameworks built on top of it, so it's their problem. Um, but I, I, really, I really honestly don't know. I expect that um, most of the stuff in Zen Framework 1 will just work right away, because I actually use in an old project that I have to work on Zen Framework 1. And I, so I'm obviously using PHP 5.5 development versions all the time, and I've so far had not encountered a problem. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, operation uh, regarding performances. We saw that uh, with uh, 5.4, uh, many guys switched only because of uh, much uh, faster performances, less memory usage, etc. Is there any difference now in 5.5? Uh, yeah, there will be two differences. Obviously, there's, there's a little bit of optimization done in the way compiled and uh, temporary variables inside the compiler are accessed, um, which reduces the memory uh, access, basically. It makes it a bit faster in general. And then the obvious thing is the opcode cache, which will, be, if it's in there, if it's going to be in PHP 5.5, will make your application right away much faster, unless it's obviously a CLI, CGI, you know, stuff that always have to spawn, then obviously opcode cache doesn't really help. Okay? But besides that, not much. Any other questions over there? Um, what were the arguments against C sharp style properties? Because that looked really useful. What were the arguments against using C sharp style properties? Oh, what are the arguments? Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of the. In I can just guess because it was just a vote in the end. Um, and I haven't followed too closely the discussion because it, it was like the third iteration of the discussion. It was a lengthy thread. So. Um, I can just assume, because that's an up, a, a topic coming up all the time uh, for good reason, is that a lot of the core developers think that the way the language changes at the moment, the language itself is too fast. Because it breaks things, it makes the language less robust, it makes it easier to have new bugs. We still have a lot of bugs concerning traits. And uh, I think Dimitri at the moment, who is one of the, you know, the guys who, the geniuses about the core or like the compiler, he really struggles with traits because he tries to fix it at the moment. Um, and it just shows that if we add complex new features, it makes the language, you know, a bit more fragile. And it's might not, it might be not worth the effort, right? These getters and setters the way they are now are good enough basically to not need a new way that is fancy and may, might break things. So there's a lot of discussion for very good reasons and a lot of people from the old core guys support this movement of give the language a rest, right? Write good APIs around it, uh, write good extensions, you know, enhance the extensions, make it faster, make PHP faster and better and more robust and fix bugs instead of adding feature and feature and feature. So I think in the end it boils down to like the old guy saying, no, nah, we don't need another feature. Okay. Uh, and then the release cycle, um, obviously it's going to be, if I correct, recall correctly, three years. So two years of actual bug fixing, one year, and the end of security only fixes, which is what 5.3 will get. But then most people rely, if you like in production, you rely on LTS support of like Ubuntu, Fedora, whatever. Any more questions? Uh, are they? I don't think so. Like, well, I think. No, no. Zend optimizes on on the edge. 
to get kicked out because of that. But basically, it's like uh, we can make a year, months more, maybe one and a half months more, and just have it in because it's so important for people to have an upcode cache. So it's kind of worth the effort. But they were like really late. <laughs> um, yeah. Anything else? There was a question over there. I was wondering when the when is the go to statement going to be depreciated? Pardon? When is the go to statement going to be depreciated? Uh, <laughs> ask Sarah. She's right there, and she introduced it, so it's all her fault. <laughs> Blame her? No, uh, it's all good. Um, I think it's a good thing. I think there are use cases. I haven't seen one yet, but I think there are. <laughs> so I don't know. Write an RFC about it if you don't like it. Okay, if there are okay, over there. Uh, long term, you might no. Um, <clears throat> so the question was, are there going to be long term supported uh, versions? And it was a long discussion when we introduced release process, um, the new release process, and the time based schedule. If we actually do LTS support, uh, and we decided no. Uh, we don't. Um, most, of the P uh, most of the project out there, open source projects, don't do that anyway and leave it up to the distributions and people who will, you know, get money for doing it. So if you want to LTS support, if it, basically the idea is if you really need LTS support, you probably have the money to buy you a Red Hat and then you get it out of the anyway, right? So, they, so screw them. They should backport, not we. Because backport is painful. We try to make our life simple, if you haven't noticed, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, okay. If there are no any questions anymore, then, uh, you know, if you have any questions, I'm around all day long, you know. As a speaker, I, I believe that the speaker should be around to get questions all the time from people. So if you just want to ask me something or whatever, just go ahead, talk to me. Uh, I'm bad at PHP coding, so don't ask me PHP questions. Um, that's all. Okay, thank you very much.